good afternoon and welcome. As people get their pizza, I thought we might as well just get started. Thank you for coming on behalf of uh, everyone at the law school and the law school's faculty. Thank you for coming to the 2016 Constitution Day celebration. Uh, this is an event that's sponsored by uh, the Office of the Provost, uh, Lauren Robel, as well as uh, the Law School, the American Constitution Society, Outlaw, SLRG, and the Women's Law Caucus. So many thanks to all those groups for sponsoring this event. Maybe a round of applause. And if we could also have a special thanks to Professor Don Johnson, who's done most of the heavy lifting to put this program together. Many thanks to Don. Um, this event each year celebrates the anniversary of the day that the 39 delegates to the Constitutional Convention signed the Constitution on September 17th, 1787. Um, this is not the only event, though, that we have that commemorates uh, Constitutional Day. Uh, a group of our law students last Thursday went to Jackson Creek Middle School and had a rousing discussion of constitutionalism. Many thanks to, to Brandon and his group. Um, and why not? Uh, and last Friday, if you made it, we had a really terrific uh, panel discussion hosted by uh, SPIA's Law and Public Policy Program, uh, BALSA, Pre-Law BALSA, uh, and other groups on voting rights. Um, that was a terrific uh, presentation last Friday at 4 p.m. And then I think we have another presentation uh, tomorrow by the Federalist Society on discussion of originalism. So a number of events. Um, I think Constitution Day is valuable and appropriate for us. Um, for us to take some time to reflect on the importance of the Constitution. It's a document that stood the test of time. Um, but I think it's also an important day, particularly for universities. Uh, great universities and great law schools have a history and thrive on intellectual debate, on an open exchange of ideas and advancing new knowledge. And Constitutional Day, for us, has always been an opportunity to learn a little bit about our history, uh, to learn a little more about uh, the rule of law, and to hear from great thinkers and public intellectuals on some of the great issues of the day. And I'm very pleased we're able to continue that tradition uh, today uh, with Professor Pam Carlin. At this time, I'm going to turn over the podium to one of our 3L students, current president of the ACS, Ashley Letterman. Uh, and then um, uh, she'll do a much more formal introduction to today's speaker. Thank you so much for coming. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the annual Constitution Day lecture. I am Ashley Linderman, Programming Chair for the American Constitutional Society here at Maurer School of Law. If anyone is interested in joining ACS, please feel free to email any of our officers whose names you can find on the student group's <laughs> website. ACS is a progressive legal organization comprised of lawyers, students, scholars, lawmakers, policy advocates, and members of the media. ACS believes that law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. Its mission is to promote the vitality of the US Constitution and the fundamental values it expresses. And that is why we are here today, to honor our country's foundational achievement, the United States Constitution and the culture of constitutionalism it has facilitated in our society. This culture of constitutionalism requires that we be in a constant conversation, participants with this great document in an ongoing dialogue about our fundamental values. In order to help us as we partake in this task this year, we are joined by Professor Pamela Carlin, and it is my honor to introduce this distinguished professor. Professor Carlin has dedicated much of her life to preserving and promoting our constitutional values. As a litigator, scholar, and professor, she is engaged in many facets of this great work. Also, we are fortunate to have Professor Don Johnson as our advisor, as she does so much for Mauer, IU, and Bloomington, in addition to her various other professional achievements. It's by virtue of her renown and the great respect with which other figures in law, politics, and the legal academy view her that we are regularly able to bring in such distinguished speakers to Mauer. Today in particular, Professor Johnson is delighted to have Professor Pamela Carlin here in Bloomington as they remain close friends. Professor Carlin is a personal inspiration for Professor Johnson after working together closely on many projects throughout the years. Professor Carlin is the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at Stanford Law School. Her primary scholarly interests lie in the areas of constitutional law and litigation. Professor Carlin received her BA, MA, and JD from Yale and clerked both on the Southern District of New York and for Justice Harry A. Blackman of the United States Supreme Court. 
Among her many honors, Professor Carlin was recognized during 2014 and 2015 when she won a number of awards as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice. A couple of years back, while reflecting on a sentiment expressed by Judge Learned Hand in the middle of this past century, Professor Carlin suggested that perhaps Judge Hand overstated his case when he wondered whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws, and upon courts, while overlooking the important role of the hearts of the countrymen play in preserving liberty. Acknowledging that what lies in the hearts and minds of the public is critical to the enterprise of constitutionalism, Professor Carlin offered a more nuanced position, suggesting, namely, that these institutions, constitutions, laws, and courts play a critical role in shaping the world in which we live. The Constitution and debate, struggle, legislation, and litigation over its meaning have played, and continue to play, a central role in our nation's struggles over liberty, equality, and similar values. Professor Carlin embodies the, the very best of our legal culture, and it is our pleasure to host her for this Constitution Day. We are delighted to hear Professor Carlin speak on the hydraulic election of 2016, the new voter denial, political parties, the rise of Donald Trump, and the courts. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pamela Carlin. Thank you all so much for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk on Constitution Day about all of those things, and I'll talk really fast so you'll be, you'll be able to get, make it to class. Um, in his poem, Election Day, November 1884, Walt Whitman called America's Choosing Day the powerfulest scene and show in the Western world. More powerful, he wrote, than the huge rifts of canyons on the Colorado River or the spasmic geyser loops of Yellowstone. But even that celebrant of tumultuous, free-willing American democracy could not have imagined a quadrennial choosing with rips and spasmic loops like 2016. <laughs> like the river or the geyser, our constitutional democracy is a hydraulic system, albeit in a more metaphorical sense. In my remarks today, I want to situate some of the distinctive features of this election season in that broader hydraulic framework. Thinking about constitutionalism from a hydraulic perspective challenges the more romantic vision of American democracy that views elections as the process by which citizens pick their leaders and thereby determine future public policy. In reality, before the first ballot is cast, vote is cast or the first ballot is counted, the potential results are already constrained and channeled. The kind of democracy we have and even the kind of democracy that we can imagine is quite path dependent. Our current politics is the product of a system produced by our past politics that has entrenched itself in a variety of ways in the structures of our constitution. The Electoral College, for example, leads candidates to, to sort of uh, uh, concentrate on small, potentially purple states like Nevada or New Mexico, and to ignore completely states with huge numbers of voters like California or New York, except when they fly in uh, to raise money and uh, cause traffic jams on the freeways. Uh, the fixed terms of office delineated in our Constitution uh, for the President and for members of Congress lead to an insanely long and costly nominating process that rivals the notorious system in the Middle Ages for electing the Doge in Venice. The unamendable constitutional guarantee, and I bet it, how many of you have actually read the whole Constitution through from beginning to end? Okay, so a couple of you. Well, you all have copies outside, so you could read it through um, uh, uh, while you're sitting here. But there are only two pieces of the Constitution that were unamendable. Does anybody know what they are? Anybody know what the unamendable parts of the Constitution are? Right, we have Article 5 that says you can amend the Constitution, but there are two things you can't do. Anybody know what they are? I can start cold calling on people. Uh, yeah. Yeah, one of them is equal representation of the states in the Senate, which is still around, and I'll talk about that in just a sec. Anybody know what the other one was? Yeah. Was it, uh, did it have a time deadline? Uh, it, it does mention time, yeah. Right, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't ban the slave trade. 
before 1808. Those are the only two pieces of the Constitution that are unamendable. Um, and the piece that's still there, the unamendable guarantee that each state has equal suffrage in the Senate, produces a legislative process that overvalues the interests of small states uh, at the expense of larger ones. So law produces elections every bit as much as elections produce law. So think about that famous M.C. Escher etching of the hand drawing the hand. That's really what our system is like. Constitutional democracy is composed of a series of these kinds of feedback loops. And ostensibly discrete doctrines governing issues such as voter registration or redistricting or political party autonomy or campaign finance or the like are part of this broader ecosystem in which pressures or imperatives surge and retreat across doctrinal boundaries. The connections between different elements of this structure and the legal regime can be hard to plumb like the River Alf and Coleridge's Kublai Khan, they sometimes run through caverns measureless to man. So the modifications of one part of the system, uh, or one doctrine, can produce unforeseen consequences decades later down the river as they interact with various external pressures. The system, to, produce, to kind of pr uh, uh, push this hydraulic metaphor one step further, is at the same time both fluid and sticky. That being said, it doesn't take an Einstein to discern a first law of political thermodynamics, that the desire for political power cannot be destroyed. At most, it can be channeled into different forms. <laughs> the Federalist Papers return to this point again and again, most famously in James Madison's uh, discussion of faction in Federalist 10. Nor does it demand an Isaac Newton to identify a third law of political motion that every attempted reform produces a corresponding series of reactions by those in power to hold on to it. As Frederick Douglass said, power never concedes anything without a demand. It never has, and it never will. So consider a few historical examples of this. Congress adopted single-member districts for elections to the House of Representatives in 1842 as a measure to ensure the representation of diverse interests but the use of single member districts to elect Congress virtually dictates that the United States has a two party system rather than a multi party system. And it requires, because the districts are geographically drawn, that the government decides which groups are going to get represented. We tell ourselves that every two years we go into a voting booth and select our representatives. But it would be just as accurate to say that every 10 years, our representatives go into back rooms with computers in them and select their constituents. <laughs> the proponents of term limits, for example, hoped that they would make elections more competitive by preventing incumbents from entrenching themselves in office. But the upshot of term limits in many states was not the return of the vaunted citizen legislatures, uh, legislators of the 1800s, a sort of group of mini George Washingtons as Cincinnatus, um, but the emergence of a herd of amateurs uninterested in, con in, in considering the long term because they won't be around to be held accountable, and a transfer of practical political power from elected legislators to the executive branch, to legislative staff, uh, and to lobbyists. A final example. The Supreme Court uh, finally intervened to overrule rural legislators' self-interested refusals to redistrict in the landmark one-person, one-vote cases of the early 1960s. But 50 years after this reapportionment revolution, the truest thing we can say is to quote Robert Frost, the poet who said the problem with a total revolution is it brings the same people back up on top. <laughs> Political gerrymandering today is more sophisticated than ever. And because the Supreme Court has shown itself simultaneously unable to police partisan redistricting and deeply suspicious of the use of race in the redistricting process, we have an endless series of lawsuits in the redistricting world that resemble nothing so much as Hamlet and Polonius' discussion of whether a cloud looks more like a camel, a weasel, or a whale. As one side tries to claim that every political move is a racial move, while the other side tries to use compliance with the Voting Rights Act as a Trojan horse for political manipulation or denies the idea that it thought about race at all. And in a series of attempts to regulate money in politics, all we've done is to move political spending into more and more covert forms as reforms crash up against the First Amendment doctrine about the regulation of political speech. Save for the notorious crack powder distinction, 
It's hard to think of a line in the law that has been subject to more withering criticism over the years than Buckley's distinction between con contributions and expenditures. As Sam Zakharoff and I pointed out 15 years ago when we introduced this idea of the law of democracy as a hydraulic system into the scholarship, because candidates can spend essentially unlimited amounts of money, but they have to raise the money in relatively small packages, the result is an unceasing preoccupation with fundraising. The effect is sort of like giving a starving person unlimited trips to a buffet table, but telling him that each time he has to bring the food back with a thimble-sized spoon. The constriction means you become obsessed with the food. House members, on average, had to raise uh, $2,315 every day that they were in office uh, to run their campaigns during the 2012 cycle, and senators were raising an average of $14,351 a day. And the pathological uh, effects of this expenditure contribution distinction go beyond its effect on candidates. Because individuals remain free to spend whatever they want on politics independently, we have a series of new, intermediate, new intermediary institutions like PACs, super PACs, 527s, and so on that have sprung up to receive and spend those funds. For a variety of reasons, these groups are far less publicly transparent and accountable than the candidates and the formal political parties whose roles they have supplanted. The money is darker than ever. So what I want to do today is talk about this hydraulic system in the context of voting and then show how it's playing out uh, in the 2016 uh, round of elections. The Supreme Court long ago described the right to vote as fundamental because it was preservative of all other rights. Uh, but what does it mean to talk about voting? Even that seemingly simple uh, idea embodies a constellation of concepts with their own hydraulic relationships to one another. And I'm going to identify three of them for you today here. Participation, aggregation, and governance. Now one thing to note about our Constitution is that although a huge amount of our Constitution is devoted to creating and reforming our democracy, it's really quite striking that nowhere in the Constitution is the actual right to vote guaranteed. We have Various protections against your right to vote being taken away for various reasons. You can't deny the right to vote on race, on gender, uh, on age for people over 18, for failure to pay a poll tax and the like. But we never affirmatively uh, grant the right to vote in the Constitution. We just use uh, the right to vote as it's created by the states as a kind of starting point to leverage uh, the federal right. Now, as a starting point, voting as participation involves the discrete activity of registering, of casting a ballot, and of having that ballot counted. Participation confers a sense of inclusion on the individuals who are granted it, and it confers a legitimacy on the final choice of the electorate regardless of the ultimate outcome. Indeed, in several contexts, the Supreme Court has squarely rejected the idea that a concern with outcome or the choices that voters can make will, will form a permissible uh, reason for limiting participation by otherwise qualified citizens. That being said, over the past 50 years, the Supreme Court has watered down the standard for analyzing restrictions on participation. How, how many people here have taken uh, constitutional law already and done equal protection clause? Okay, for a lot of you, you haven't. So I'm gonna give you a very short version of this, which is uh, when you have a law that denies people something that they wanna have, uh, the courts, when they review that law, have a variety of different standards they could use for, for reviewing it. Um, and the analog I like to use here sometimes is a, a little bit like dress codes. So rationality review is kind of like the hip hop style uh, of uh, scrutiny because the clothes don't have to fit very, very well. They're very loose and baggy. They just have to cover more or less what needs to be covered and not cover more or less what needs not to be covered. So rationality review is if you can think up any reason why this is good enough, it's good enough. At the other end of the scale, strict scrutiny is kind of like the spandex of constitutional law. It fits body tight. The fit between why you're doing this and the classification you're using has to be super tight. And the courts are going to be very suspicious. Uh, so uh, if you go back to the Warren Court, they applied strict scrutiny, this spandex theory, to restrictions on the right to vote. And they said, it's not good enough to say there's some connection between rational use of the ballot and this restriction. It has to be necessary. You have to, it has to be necessary to restrict voting in this way to achieve some compelling government purpose. And they did that in cases like Dunn against Blumstein and Kramer against Union Free School District. By now, on the other hand, the Supreme Court has moved to a kind of sliding scale 
of looking at restrictions on the right to vote and has said, you know, we consider how big a restriction is this and how important is the government interest and as long as there doesn't seem to be any obvious discrimination going on, we're going to give the government a fair amount of leeway. And they did this uh, most notably in a case from Hawaii called Burdick against Takushi, and then in a case from, from here in Indiana called Crawford against Marion County Board of Elections. Uh, and that's the, really the starting point for modern uh, interpretations of the Constitution's restriction on voting restrictions. So that's participation. It's the idea that you get to cast a ballot and to have that ballot counted. But even though voting uh, as it, participation is really critical, uh, to our sense of democracy, the primary function of voting is not simply to delineate the boundaries of the political community. Rather, the idea behind voting is that we combine individual votes to reach some collective decision, such as nominating a presidential candidate, electing a legislator, or passing a, a referendum or the like. That's why so much of the law of democracy focuses on voting as aggregation. That is the rules by which the system determines who wins the election. And there are lots of rules out there. Remember a little while ago I mentioned the Doge in Venice. The way they did the elections there is they would have an election and then they'd select a bunch of candidates. And from that candidate group of candidates, they'd have a raffle, a lottery, and they'd pick a subset of them. And then people would vote from among the people who had won that raffle. Then they'd have another raffle. And they had 26 stages to this. So it starts to sound a little bit like the nomination process for president. <laughs> um, and it has about the same level of rationality. Uh, and you get an absolute ruler with the doge. And I'll leave you uh, to think about that uh, for just a moment. But uh, American law is honeycombed with these kinds of aggregation rules. And these rules powerfully influence who will win and who will lose, ranging from things like the Electoral College, which means you don't need to get a majority of the votes of, the of citizens, you don't need a nationwide majority, you need a majority of the electoral votes, to the use of single member districted elections, which determines almost always uh, that the median voter in a particular district is really powerful, and how you draw the districts determine who those median voters are. At the same time, because aggregation rules are often sticky, either permanently as a constitutional matter, for example, the Electoral College, or for the foreseeable future, which is we could change, we could move to a proportional representation system tomorrow for Congress, except for the fact that not a single member of Congress would vote for it. Um, incumbents often tinker with the participation rules to shift the composition of the electorate and affect the electoral outcome, because they can't tinker with the aggregation, with the aggregation rules directly. But when we start thinking about aggregation rules, this demands that we have some normative account of who should win an election. Vote dilution, which is the most common sort of claim about aggregation rules, almost by definition demands some notion of full strength. Uh, at the first oral argument I ever did at the Supreme Court in a case called Chisholm against Romer, which is about judicial elections, uh, Justice Scalia asked uh, the following question, which is, you don't know what watered beer is unless you know what beer is, right? <laughs> this is the Brewski theory uh, of constitutional law. Uh, but it's true, if you don't know what beer is, how do you know that your beer has been watered? Um, that baseline problem has bedeviled the Supreme Court for a generation in an array of different contexts. In recent years, for example, there has been an outpouring of scholarship seeking to provide the court with a judicially manageable standard for analyzing one particularly important aggregation issue, the aggregation issue that involves unconstitutional partisan gerrymandering. The Supreme Court's first attempt to deal directly with this problem was a 1986 case involving legislative districts here in Indiana, a case called Davis against Bandemer. And it was a spectacular failure. The case was just a spectacular failure. 20 years later, although the Supreme Court had said that uh, claims of partisan gerrymandering were justiciable, there had only been one case finding partisan gerrymandering anywhere in the country, and it involved judicial elections in North Carolina and a very peculiar system there. Everywhere else, courts would say things like, yeah, it's true that this looks really bad, but, and my favorite example here is um, California, where Phil Burton drew the congressional districts, including one for his brother, John Burton, uh, that Phil referred to as my contribution to modern art. Um, other people referred to this as the Jesus district. Not because when they looked at it, they said, Jesus, that's a district. Um, but because uh, it was uh, taking all of the parts of San Francisco Bay that were on little promontories, and you had to be like Jesus to go from one part of, part of the district to another, because you had to be able to walk on water. Uh, and the Supreme Court, the, the, the federal district court said, and the Supreme Court summarily affirmed, that this was not too much of a political gerrymandering, because after all, although the Democrats had managed to take almost all of the seats 
seats in the congressional district, including taking a whole bunch of them away from incumbent Republicans. This was not a problem because Ronald Reagan, who was a Republican from California, was president of the United States. So what was the problem? Uh, that's why I say it was a spectacular failure. Uh, a generation later, the Supreme Court had a case from uh, Pennsylvania called Veith against Jubilee, and although all nine of the justices then sitting recognized that there was some constitutional problem here, uh, four of the justices thought that the issue was completely non-justiciable because they couldn't come up with a manageable judicial standard for this. Four of the other justices thought there was a clear judicially manageable standard, although they disagreed and split three ways about what that clear standard was. Um, think about that for a moment. Uh, and then uh, Justice uh, Kennedy uh, said he hadn't yet seen a judicially manageable standard, but he really would like to see one. So he wasn't prepared to say uh, anything yet, uh, which is what Justice Scalia colorfully called Justice Kennedy's never say never approach. <laughs> but here's the thing. Once we think about uh, participation and then we think about a conception of voting that looks at electoral outcomes, aggregation, rather than just at the entry into voting booths, it becomes clear that election day and the ballot represent only an intermediate path along the, along the way to the determination of policies by elected officials. And with regard to that question, the critical question for an individual can't simply be whether he or she can go into a voting booth and cast a ballot or whether he or she can elect uh, a preferred candidate. Rather, the question has to focus on whether electing that candidate gets that citizen the ability to get her preferred policies enacted into law. And this is what I mean by voting as governance. It rests on the idea that the uh, voting rules are important not just for you, but for people elsewhere too, because that matters to what the composition of the overall, uh, 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 overall legislature is going to be. So if you think back to the reapportionment revolution that I talked about earlier, one person, one vote, Whatever its rhetoric was about individual rights, and it is an opinion marbled through with rhetoric about how if your vote is worth less than another citizen's vote, you're that much less of a citizen or the like. Um, whatever the rhetoric, it really was a case about governance. That is that the electoral process is about how we compose a legislature and not just how we can determine individual winners and losers. Because the voters in the overpopulated districts in all of these states, after all, they were free to go to the polls and cast a ballot and have that ballot counted. They were able to elect the representatives of their choice from their district. The problem was that when their legislators got to the legislature, they were being outvoted by legislators from districts with many fewer people in them. So the one person, one vote cases rested on a commitment to majoritarian governance and democratic decision making. The Supreme Court used an aggregation rule there that voters had to be put in districts with essentially equal populations to get to a preferred governance outcome. So too, because the law of democracy is always changing, voters who participate today are choosing the public officials who'll tweak the election system in which voters tomorrow are going to participate. Who governs determine who can later participate and therefore by what rules their votes are going to be aggregated. The 2016 election cycle provides a series of powerful illustrations of this point about the hydraulics in democracy. And so in the rest of our time together, I'm going to focus on three examples. The new vote denial, the rise of Donald Trump, uh, and the Supreme Court vacancy to show how participation, aggregation, and governance affect one another, as well as to show some broader hydraulic effects in the system. So let's start with the new vote denial. Uh, George W. Bush is alleged to have said, I believe we are on an irreversible course towards more freedom and democracy, but that could change. <laughs> that remark, whether apocryphal or not, perfectly captures a central point about voting as participation. Although our conventional view is a kind of triumphalist one in which we've had a consistent expansion of the franchise, and if all you did was read the Constitution and not read anything about American history, that's exactly what you'd see. We have continually expanded the right to vote. The United States, in fact, has gone through a series of cycles in which whatever the formal constitutional regime, the right to vote has expanded and contracted. After more than a generation of expansions in the right to vote, spearheaded by the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the National Voter Registration Act of 1993, polarized state legislatures have produced a spate of legislation cutting back on voting rights. Voter ID is probably the best known of these retreats, particularly in Indiana, 
But others include cutbacks on early voting or cutbacks on same-day registration, restrictions on voter registration drives, and changes in the rules for counting provisional ballots. For example, uh, what happened in North Carolina uh, where provisional ballots, uh, it used to be that you could vote anywhere in your county and they'd check and if you were entitled to vote in the county, they'd count your vote for whichever offices you were supposed to uh, have voted for. Now they require you to go to the right polling place. And this problem, which is often referred to as the right church wrong pew problem, um, is a real one. It's a real one, and especially if any of you have ever had to vote at a voting super center, have any of you have ever had to do that? They'll have four or five different precincts voting in the same high school gymnasium. You get in the wrong line, and if it's a long line and people are frustrated, they'll, they'll, the uh, official will just give you a provisional ballot. Well, the federal government requires them to give you the provisional ballot, but there's no federal law about whether the ballot should be counted or not. That's up to states to do. And some states basically will only count the provisional ballot if it is a major screw up by the polling officials. Nothing else will lead to it being counted. Uh, now, as late as 2000, only 14 states required voters to present any kind of identity document in order to vote. And the laws on the books then, which had been passed uh, often with bipartisan support, were fairly lenient laws. Nearly all of those laws, even if they required you to provide uh, uh, an ID, were provided voters with some way to cast a ballot even if they lacked documentary proof of identity. That low-key system changed dramatically after the 2000 presidential election. The closeness of the election, combined with an obvious uh, set of uh, problems in Florida, focused public attention on election administration in a way that they hadn't been focused before. Potential conflicts over immigration spilled into voting rights because the dramatic increases and, and, and salience of immigration played a role in tensions over whether, whether measures were needed uh, to protect the integrity of the voting process. Nearly all of the contemporary voting ID laws were enacted along party lines by Republican-dominated legislatures in states with Republican governors. This is not surprising, given the empirical relation between turnout and election uh, outcomes. Put simply, in the recent past, Democrats tend to benefit from higher voter turnout, while Republicans do better in low turnout elections. We now have an inconsistent patchwork across the country. 33 states have some form of voter ID requirements in force for the 2016 election. And the laws from state to state vary dramatically in their stringency. Among the United States' five most populous states, for example, California, New York, and Illinois continue to allow registered voters to cast a ballot without any additional documentation, unless you registered by mail and it's the first time you're going to vote at the polls, in which case you can show any one of literally hundreds of documents ranging from your driver's license to a bank statement to a utility bill that just shows that you live at the address where you say you live where you vote. I've actually voted in New York, in California, in Connecticut, and Virginia, um, and I hasten to say never all in the same election, um, and I have never once been asked to show any form of identity document to vote. Florida requires uh, voters uh, to provide a document from a relatively long list, but it allows voters who don't have that that document to cast a provisional ballot which election officials have to count if the signature on the provisional ballot matches the signature back at the elections office that you signed when you registered to vote in the first place. Texas, by contrast, has one of the strictest voter ID laws in the country. That law, which was struck down by uh, the en banc Fifth Circuit this summer, uh, in a case I had the privilege of working on while I was at the Department of Justice, would not have permitted the use of IDs issued by public state in-state in universities, so no using your UT ID to vote, would not have allowed you to use your government ID if it was issued by a local government, uh, so, for example, a police officer could not show his police ID card, but you'll be pleased to know you could use your concealed carry permit uh, to vote, uh, showing that the Second Amendment uh, lives. Um, well, hundreds of thousands of registered voters in Texas lack documents that would enable them to vote. This new vote denial coincided, and I use that word advisedly, with a doctrinal shift on the Supreme Court that I mentioned earlier, the replacement of strict scrutiny with a sliding scale uh, undue burden test for restrictions on the ability to cast a ballot and have it counted. Justice Stevens' controlling opinion for the Supreme Court in Crawford against Marion County Election Board, the <laughs> leading contemporary case, the uh, Indiana ID case, uh, deemed it, as he said, fair to infer that partisan considerations may have played a significant role in the enactment of Indiana's voter ID statute. 
But the court nonetheless upheld the law against a claim of unconstitutional motivation because it was supported as well by what the court called neutral and sufficiently strong justifications, namely the prevention of fraud and the preservation of voter confidence. That position, that doctrinal position, marks an additional significant and unacknowledged doctrinal shift that I want to point out to you. The Supreme Court long ago held that once a plaintiff has shown that an impermissible intent was a motivating factor, and the Supreme Court actually did its own italics for that a in a motivating factor in a government's decision, a reviewing court must determine by a preponderance of the evidence that the government would have reached the same decision even in the absence of that factor. The Crawford Court did not ask, let alone answer, that question. Moreover, the Supreme Court long ago held that fencing out from the franchise a sector of the population because of the way they may vote is constitutionally impermissible. What seems to have happened over the last decades is the transplantation of this predominant factor motivating the legislature's decision test, uh, which came from Shaw cases about whether race played too much of a role in redistricting, uh, into judicial scrutiny of participation claims. But the Shaw claims are not about participation. They were about governance. And so what we've seen is the move back into the most basic ideas about participation of a much more deferential standard. Moreover, although the court has articulated its test as an undue burden standard, the test seems oddly rationality review-like in, uh, in its approach to the question of evidence. The primary justifications given for restrictive, and ab restrictive registration and absentee voting regulation is the prevention of fraud. But there's virtually no evidence of significant amounts of voter impersonation fraud. Uh, Professor Spencer Overton uh, did a study a couple of years back that suggested that a stringent I photo ID law will prevent more than 6,000 qualified citizens from casting a ballot for every fraudulent vote it might prevent. And you had a great example of that here in Indiana in the 2008 uh, presidential primaries where 12 elderly nuns were turned away from a voting, play, a voting poll in South Bend by a fellow sister who was actually one of the election officials there because they didn't have current state or uh, 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 federal identification bearing their photographs. They were retired nuns, so a lot of them had expired driver's licenses. Um, these 12 nuns were more people than the entire documented population of in-person fraudulent voters in Indiana's history dating back to 1816. Um, the spirit of the law killeth. Um, finally, the new voting laws are hydraulic in the sense that their turnout on uh, election, uh, their effects on turnout or election results are complicated. For example, a number of political scientists have suggested that at least in the short run, the imposition of new voter restrictions may prompt a counter-mobilization that might actually increase uh, turnout among uh, affected groups. Uh, and the actual uh, outcome effects will occur only in elections where the margin of victory is less than the percentage of citizens precluded from casting a ballot. In a state like Hawaii in 1960, which John F. Kennedy won by 115 votes, uh, or in Florida in 2000, where George Bush won by one vote. Um, no, he won by 537 <laughs> votes. I'm not bitter. Um, uh, the restrictive uh, laws could well affect the outcome. And of course, at the local level, these turnout effects can actually be quite important. Well, if the new vote denial illustrates doctrinal seepage, uh, then the emergence of Donald Trump as the Republican Party's presidential nominee it illustrates a different set of hydraulic forces emerging from the current hyperpolarized political environment. Much of the academic discussion of partisan polarization is focused on the increased ideological distance between the two parties. Um, for example, there's something called the Poole Rosenthal scores, which measure how conservative or liberal members of Congress are. And from 1900 through, say, 2000, uh, there was always overlap between the two parties. That is, the most conservative Democrats were more conservative than the most liberal Republicans. That has disappeared. So that now the most liberal Democrat, uh, most conservative Democrat overall, is more liberal than the most liberal uh, Republican overall. And so a lot of the academic uh, 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 literature has focused on the way in which the two parties are more ideologically homogenous than ever and how voters have kind of sorted themselves into the two parties more than ever. Donald Trump is orthogonal to that divide. Uh, the aspect of polarization that he taps into involves not the ideological crystallization of the two parties, but the concomitant, if contingent, decline in civility. 
If political discourse had not already degraded over the past decade, it's hard to imagine that Trump would have gained the traction he's gained. Conservative political actors ignored the warnings of Hosea 8-7, and they are reaping the whirlwind. More profoundly, the apparent inability of the Republican Party to stop an ideologically capricious Aravist uh, from hijacking its nomination processes rests on a way that changes that were initially extrinsic to the formal political process have altered the political environment. The great uh, American political scientist V.O. Key long ago described American political parties as comprising three subgroups. The party in government, that's elected officials who are affiliated with the party. The party leadership, what we might think of today as the party establishment. And the party in the electorate, that is the voters who vote uh, for that party. A general assumption going into the 2016 election cycle was that the money primary would be the dominant factor in who was going to get uh, nominated and ultimately elected. Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush, for example, amassed huge war chests from large donors, not only to finance their actual campaigns, but also to deter other entrants from even coming into the uh, process. And recent election cycles have been characterized by massive spending, primarily on paid media buys. And the general thinking was that the candidate with the most resources would have huge political advantages. Moreover, the popular focus on Citizens United, which has always seemed a bit misguided to me, since the massive increases in political spending had both predated that decision and nothing in that decision changed them, reinforced the sense that the election was going to be primarily about fundraising and spending by the political establishment and its affiliates. But 2016 may be when two underlying shifts in our culture finally began to shape the political process. The first, which has been a focus of my colleague Nate Persley at Stanford, is the rise of new media. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, cable TV shows pitched at ideological slices of the population and the like mean both that candidates now have potential access to a variety of communications tools that don't demand the huge outlays that were extracted by network television and that fewer and fewer voters are relying on network television for their sources of political information. Uh, either from programs or from paid ads. A celebrity candidate is an entirely predictable consequence of the kind of celebrity pseudo-journalism that attracts a significant chunk of the electorate. Donald Trump has not needed to raise the massive amounts of money that prior candidates have needed to raise to get his message out because he's managed to induce the media to provide the coverage for free. So that shift in the new media is really critical. And I think going forward, it's going to matter more how Google and Facebook set their feeds and their policies than how the networks do. And that changes who is involved in politics and how that politics is going to play out. The second shift is that even as the parties have become more distinct from each other, they've become weaker as organizations. There no longer really is a party leadership in the classical sense. A decade ago, Michael Kang, who's a political scientist and lawyer at Emory, wrote a very valuable article that he called The Hydraulics of po and Politics of Party Regulation, in which he used the responses to the McGovern-Fraser reforms, which were reforms at the, really in the 19, early 1970s to change how parties nominated their candidates from bosses and caucuses and the like to primaries. Uh, he said that that shift uh, ultimately didn't make it easier for the people to control elections because clever leadership had managed by uh, jimmying the primaries and setting things like the super primaries and everything to regain its control. He said uh, in 2005 that party leaders had quietly reestablished control over uh, presidential nominations. It may have taken another decade, but party leaders in this election seem to have lost control of that process. Moreover, the dizzying array of participation and aggregation rules. In some states, they're caucuses. In some states, they're open primaries. Uh, in some states, there are closed primaries. Uh, in some states, the primary determines who the delegation is. In other states, it doesn't. Uh, all of these things uh, mean that the path-dependent nature of the nomination process uh, has run amok. The order in which the primaries occur has as much of an effect uh, as anything else which is why you still have people focusing on Iowa and New Hampshire, which between the two of them, I think, have eight electoral votes or nine electoral votes. Donald Trump is the beneficiary of an interaction between a series of rules that were adopted over several decades and a set of external shocks to the political system. The framers of our Constitution were worried about the emergence of political parties, which they called faction. 
We now seem, unfortunately, to have faction without the stability of the political party system that emerged at the beginning of the 19th century. Well, perhaps the most widely quoted remark ever made about the relationship between the Constitution between, and judicial interpretation of the Constitution and politics comes from a fictional Chicago bartender, uh, Mr. Dooley, uh, of Finley Peter Dunn's humor, humor columns. Mr. Dooley and his friend Hennessy uh, were discussing a case called Downs Against Bidwell that I'm sure, has anybody read Downs Against Bidwell? Anybody want to say what the case is about? I see a couple of you nodded, but then when I said, anybody want to say what the case is about? <laughs> no, okay. Downs Against Bidwell was one of the so-called insular cases that were decided by the Supreme Court in the period around 1901. Uh, these cases arose after the Spanish-American War uh, when the United States first became an imperial power in the sense that it had a large amount of conquered territory that it got during that war, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit of Cuba uh, and the like. Um, anyway, we, we seized a whole bunch of, of, of the Spanish Empire's territory and we had no intention of making these places states. So it was unlike the expansion of the United States continentally where you know we conquered some area and then we said, well, we're gonna make this into a state at some point. The, we had no uh, desire to deal with these areas by extending statehood to them. So this, the, the question then became, well, what about the Constitution? Does the Constitution even apply in these places? And it involved things like taxation, uh, the Eighth Amendment, uh, the due process clause and the like. And it may sound kind of abstruse, this question, but it actually came back to light again in dealing with uh, the war on terror and the status of Guantanamo, which is under the control of the United States but not part of any state. Uh, anyway, here's what Mr. Dooley had to say about this when he was talking about the, uh, the Downs Against Bidwell case. And I highly advise you to read the entire uh, thing if you're finding constitutional law uh, at all challenging or complicated because it's a marvelous parody of a Supreme Court opinion. He goes through this whole parody, you know, Justice X is dissenting on this but agreeing with that and saying to the other justice, what about this? And one justice saying, oh, no, never mind. It, it's, it's really great. But here's how, the, here's how the little piece ends. And there you have the decision, Hennessy, that's shaken the intellects of the nation to their very foundations, or will if they try to read it. Some say it leaves the flag up in the air, and some say that's where it leaves the Constitution. Anyhow, something's in the air, but there's one thing I'm sure about. What's that, asked Mr. Dooley. That is, said Mr. Dooley, no matter whether the Constitution follows the flag or not, the Supreme Court follows the election returns. <laughs> the hydraulic view suggests we can turn this aphorism back around on itself. Quite often, and most notoriously, of course, in Bush against Gore, the election returns follow the Supreme Court in the sense that they're shaped by it. And the relationship is even more hydraulic than that. The membership of the Supreme Court at time zero shapes the legality of the participation and election rules at time one, which determines who's going to win the election and therefore determines who's going to be nominated and who's going to be confirmed as a Supreme Court justice at time two, thereby adjudicating the legality of the participation and aggregation rules for an election at time three, and so on and so on and so on. The death this past winter of Justice Antonin Scalia threw this point into sharp relief. The constitutional structure means that justices on the United States Supreme Court hold their office during good behavior, and good behavior is a term of art, um, <laughs> which as a practical matter means they hold it for life. Their tenure extends long beyond the terms of the president who nominated them. Only a few years ago, a district judge who was still sitting died at the age of 101 who'd been uh, nominated by President Kennedy. Uh, and Justice Stevens, who sat on the Supreme Court till quite recently, was nominated uh, by President Ford. So as American politics has become more and more polarized, so has membership on the Supreme Court. Since Justice Stevens' retirement a half dozen years ago, the partisan divide has mapped fairly neatly onto the court's most salient ideological division. All of the justices who've been nominated by Democratic presidents are more liberal in some respects that are important to the issues of greatest salience to the American people than any of the justices nominated by Republican presidents. There are some areas where this doesn't hold true and they're really interesting. Uh, I managed actually to lose a Supreme Court a case a couple of years back. I lost it 5-4 and you know how in bowling they have these kind of weird splits? Well, I, I think of the split by which I lost 5-4 as one of those weird splits. I got the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts' vote. I got Justice Scalia's vote. I got Justice Kennedy's vote. Uh, and I got Justice Stevens' vote. And I lost 
And you might say to yourself, self, how could this happen? It must have been the quality of the advocacy. Um, <laughs> but it's the only case that Justice Thomas has had the assigning power on in his entire time on the Supreme Court, because all four justices senior to him uh, voted in uh, the dissent, which was you know, the textualist, the liberal, the swing justice, and the conservative. What was I doing wrong? <laughs> I, I, when I wake up in the middle of the night, and I often do, I, I, I say to myself, it was your fault. <laughs> When it comes to the law of democracy, the votes are pretty predictable, and the Supreme Court has recently divided across the board on these cases uh, five to four. They've done it with regard to the constitutionality of a key provision of the Voting Rights Act, a variety of campaign finance laws, uh, how to interpret the remaining provisions of the Voting Rights Act, and how to analyze polit political and racial gerrymandering claims. Each of those decisions has influenced and will continue to influence our politics for cycles to come. And whether those decisions should be extended, confined, underruled, overruled, circumruled, or the like, is likely to come back in front of the Supreme Court again and again. So the stakes were already high in this election for control of a court that shapes the environment in which future democracy takes place. Then came the Senate Majority Leader's announcement that the Senate would refuse to consider any nomination on the grounds, and here I'm going to quote him, that the American people should have a vo voice in the selection of their next Supreme Court justice, and therefore this vacancy should not be filled until we have a new president, that is, after the 2016 election. Ironically, the framers thought they were setting up a process where the American people would have very little voice in selecting judges. The original Constitution, of course, not only made judges unelected, but made presidents and senators, the two groups that actually decided uh, who would be nominated and who would be confirmed unelected, or at least not directly elected by the people. Moreover, the framers were perfectly capable of requiring an intervening election when they thought it was important to do so. That, after all, is precisely what the 27th Amendment does uh, in providing that no law varying the compensation for the services of senators or representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. There is, uh, obviously, and you can search the Constitution for this for a while, no similar deferral when it comes to the Senate's advise and consent function. What the hydraulic approach tells us is that the ramifications of so directly tying the nomination and confirmation of Supreme Court justices to particular outcomes may emerge far downstream in unpredictable ways. In the meantime, an eight-member court is likely to face a slew of election-related or election-affecting litigation. The 4-4 tie at the end of last month regarding whether North Carolina could put its new vote restrictions into effect is the most salient example, but there will undoubtedly be more. In the meantime, perhaps we should all simply recite the election administrator's prayer. Lord, let this election not be close. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes. You talked about some of the paradoxes and, and, uh, and particularly how Trump has been able to run a, uh, a low-fi... David? You um, have a microphone here. Uh, so, I know some people have classes at 115, so people can come... Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. well, first of all, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you back about the issue of money in politics. Um, I'm listening. What, is, what is the impact of dark money or even not so dark but big money on American governance? And could one use that as the basis for a challenge to the current role of money in politics? So the, the answer to the question is there's a huge influence of it. I think more of the influence plays out in lobbying even than in elections themselves. In elections themselves, the, the way it plays out is it enables you to buy staff who do get out the vote and it enables you to buy, um, it enables you to buy um, uh, uh, broadcast, broadcast time. That's not mostly 
for candidates, the dark money. The dark money, obviously, is being spent as independent expenditures there. And it's problematic because people don't know where it comes from. And oftentimes, you know, at, at the national level, maybe one thing I didn't say in the, in the talk, but I think this is true, is at the presidential level, I don't think that is really what matters very much because voters focus and it's a high turnout election and the parties have every incentive to mobilize. Where it really plays out is in local elections where groups with names that don't actually indicate who's funding them come in so you get something like you know responsible parents and what it is is it's an anti tort law group or and and these are elections that are low salient so there's very little turnout there's very little news coverage so almost everything that is covered is the ads and the like and there it's a there it's a real problem the problem right now is the current Supreme Court that we have has a notion of what counts as corruption, which is the only justification for regulating. That's a very narrow definition of corruption. So you would need to change that notion of what counts as corruption to something broader. Uh, and one interesting thing is the Montana Supreme Court tried to do that in a case that involved a Montana equivalent to Citizens United. And the Supreme Court just blew it out of the water without even having oral argument which was very frustrating um, because Montana has a history of the extractive. It's a state with not many people and a lot of minerals. Um, and so the extractive industries, copper industry in particular in the 19 teens had been extraordinarily corrupting of the state legislature. And that experience is what led Montana to do what it did. The Supreme Court, you know, and the interesting thing is like the, the liberals just said, we didn't even see any point in granting cert here because it was obvious what was gonna happen. So you need to have, you know, and this is one of the areas where, you know, I'd like to encourage, especially the students in the audience, because it's going to take a long time to do this, to be thinking about how do you how do you define corruption in a way that leads the Supreme Court to care about it, or inequality in a way that leads the Supreme Court to care about it. But until that happens, there's not going to be any major change in campaign finance law. Is that is that responsive to the question? Any anybody else? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've heard. Thank you. I have a loud voice. I've heard so many elected officials just frustrated and angry how they can't do anything legislative. They go down the street and fundraise all the time, cold calls. Uh, my sister lived in England where the election period was like two or three months and everybody shared from a common kitty. And when I think of the resources we siphon off and uh, psychobabble and all that. Uh, will there a, is there any uh, mood in Congress to change it? Because they hate the system too. Uh, they are not happy with it. And so, is there any chance for that? So let me start with the fundamental constitutional problem we have, which England does not have, which is we know when our elections are going to be. The reason why we can't have two week long election cycles is because I know today exactly when the 2020 election is going to be. I know today exactly where the 2018 election is going to be. So if I'm somebody who's running, I don't have that luxury that uh, the English system where they have the election within two or three weeks, the Israelis, I mean, every other major democracy, as far as I know, has a kind of outward, uh, out, outer limit on how long you can stay in office without an election. So in England, I think they have to call an election every five or six years. But within that time period, you don't know at all when the election's going to be. And that changes the dynamic, right? So we can't change that dynamic without fundamentally changing our system. Um, and that has a set of effects that, as I suggest, kind of make this difficult. Second thing that we don't have is we don't have a parliamentary system. One of the reasons why in a place like England you can get things done is if you get a majority in parliament, you also take over the executive branch. In the United States, we don't have a system like that. And because of gerrymandering, um, the, house, the house is not going to change its fundamental composition very often, even if there are shifts in the electorate. So you can have what we now have, which is a politics in which generally the Democrats are going to get more votes than the Republicans for the presidency. They may or may not, depending on which senators are up, get more or, or less votes in the Senate. But no matter how many votes the Democrats get in the House of Representatives, because of the way the districts are drawn in a lot of states, 
the overall composition is not going to change. So that's a second thing. And there are some interesting parts of our Constitution that nobody pays much attention to that have to do with this. The, the one I like best is the incompatibility clause, which essentially says, if you're a member of Congress, you can't hold executive office as well, which makes it impossible to do in the United States what's been done uh, in a lot of parliamentary countries, which is you're an elected, you're a senator, but you also serve as Secretary of Defense or the like. Can't do that in the United States. A lot of other countries have two other things that we don't have. One is government-funded political parties. Um, and that's an area where I think we're more likely to see change with a new Supreme Court if um, the Democrat, if the Democrats nominate and confirm the ninth justice. That is, I don't think Citizens United has much of a chance of being overruled very soon, and I'm not sure what it would do if it did, but I think what could be overruled fairly soon, or underruled or circumruled in a way that means it just has no legs at all, is a case like the uh, Arizona Free Enterprise PAC case, which is a case uh, that made it hard for Arizona to have a public financing system that worked. But that requires people to be willing to pay. That is, if you're not willing, you, you know, we get the elections we're willing to pay for, and some people are willing to pay a lot for our elections, and they get the elections they really want, and the rest of us, not so keen on paying for the elections, and we get the elections that people who pay for them get. So the, the, that's a kind of long answer to your question, which is there are some parts of our Constitution that make it difficult to do that, uh, and there are some parts of our politics that make it difficult to do that. And there's also a distrust of campaign finance reform that's done by politicians because it's very hard to separate necessarily what's done because it actually reforms the system from what's done to preserve the chances of the people who are already in office to stay in office. So if you look back at the arguments that were made in Congress at the time of BICRA, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, some of them were about attack ads, and it was congressmen getting up and saying, I really hate it when people run attack ads against me. We need to do something about the attack ads. Well, yes and no, right? So. It, it, it's a little, it's a, it's a little bit complicated, but we clearly could set up a system consistent, I think, with where the First Amendment now is that would be more responsive. But people lack the political will to do it. So is that? Yeah, but they might because they cannot stand fundraising. So that might be the. Yeah, and, and Vince, Bla Vince Blasey, who's a professor at the University of Virginia, wrote a whole article saying that actually the legitimate government interest in uh, changing the way uh, politics is funded is to make legislators spend more time on their jobs and less time raising money. Exactly. Um, and it got precisely nowhere, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful argument. I mean, yes. you, talk to, you talk to elected officials, and dialing for dollars is a huge share of what they do, um, and, nobody likes, and nobody likes it. And, and you dial for dollars, by the way, in a very different place than you uh, troll for votes. Um, there are some wonderful maps. The Center for Responsive Politics has done a great map that shows you like zip code by zip code, like where are the biggest donors in the United States. And there are, there are like it, parts of New York City that donate more money to candidates running in various parts of the country than all of the donations they get from the people who actually could vote for them. I mean, so that money primary is, is, is really critical. Two questions. One, could you address the recent litigation campaign to could you address the recent lit litigation campaign to restrict laws requiring disclosures of various campaign contributions and expenditures? Second, on the Supreme Court's doctrinal shift yeah. regarding voting rights, could you talk a little bit about at least some parts of election laws which sort of wind up necessarily being arbitrary? where a strict scrutiny test doesn't work so well. I'm thinking of ballot access, hours of registration, and, and that sort of thing. Sure. So the, the, the first question about the, the anti-disclosure regime is, I think it's such an amazing example of bait and switch, which is the people who are running the anti-disclosure campaigns kept saying, let's get rid of all of the restrictions on expenditures or corporate spending or contributions to candidates or everything, and just have a full disclosure regime. And they kept pointing to the Commonwealth of Virginia, which has that regime, and said, look, its politics are very clean, it's a competitive state, why don't you do that? And the minute, of course, that they won, all of the issues on uh, expenditures, they start saying, oh, the disclosure stuff is really bad too. And here's an area where actually I kind of liked Justice Scalia because he had a, uh, an opinion in one of the disclosure cases where he said, you know, uh, America is supposed to be the home of the free and the brave, and if you're not brave enough 
uh, to have your disclosures, uh, have your, your spending disclosed, then you're not really one of us. Um, I mean, he didn't put it quite that way, but that's, that's kind of what he was saying. And the thing is that I, I was just reading an article that hasn't come out yet about the effective disclosure rules on participation. And for big donors, it doesn't seem to have any effect at all. That is, they give. Where you do see um, some concern is small donors. That is, people who don't want their neighbors to necessarily know um, who they're giving money to. And so I would be inclined to have, uh, uh, you know, to have very rigorous disclosure rules. And I think the courts are going to allow very rigorous disclosure rules for everything beyond really what you're talking about, kind of individual small money disclosures, where I can see the, some of the courts are going to be concerned about those because of the potential for, you know, depressing people's participation. But I don't think the disclosure, the challenge to disclosure writ large is going to get very far, ultimately. Okay, the second question was about, well, there are some rules that you just got to have, like we're going to vote on Tuesdays. Does anybody know why we vote on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November? Anybody know why Congress picked that? Yeah. Yeah, so it was the, you went, it's, you, you worshiped at home on Sunday. This goes back to when a lot of people went to the county seat to vote. You worshiped on Sunday, you went to the market on Monday, Tuesday was free, and November the harvest was over, right? Oh. So it's like not super important for most of us today, because I think what, 2% of Americans live on farms, and they're the only people for whom the first Tuesday after the first Monday in October, uh, November is super, super helpful. So yeah, there are some rules that, and, and, and I think this is actually what, uh, I have a piece coming out about this, this is what people struggle about with all election rules under the Voting Rights Act as well, which is any rule is gonna wait, raise the cost of voting for individuals who have to comply with the rule. And because, um, in particular in the places that I was working, African Americans and Latinos have fewer resources than Anglos and whites, the cost is gonna depress the turnout among blacks and Latinos more than it's gonna depress the... So the question then becomes, well, what's the fit between this rule and some permissible government purpose? And for a lot of the rules, it's just you've gotta have orderly elections, and that's gonna be good enough. Um, and even when the court was applying strict scrutiny, it wasn't applying strict scrutiny to things like residency requirements. That is, yeah, got to live in the jurisdiction where you want to vote. Um, and it wasn't applying them to things like simple requirement for registration. That is, it was taking as a given the idea that there's some floor of eligibility, and they're just applying strict scrutiny to things that took people who met that floor of eligibility out of the, out of the picture. That is, it was taking as a given what voting kind of was about. Um, so it's possible that that's the way to go. I mean, that's certainly the way to go under the Voting Rights Act, which is to just use the tenuousness prong of the Senate report factors vigorously. Um, but yeah, all voting systems are going to result in some people finding it more difficult to vote uh, than, than others. The amazing thing here, this is just a comparative point, is how much less the United States does than virtually any other Western democracy. That is. ID requirements in most of the world are not a problem because the government issues a national ID card to everybody. And what's really interesting about the United States is on the one hand we have this huge push towards voter ID and on the other hand we have this huge suspicion of big government like knowing where you are. But of course that's what an ID uh, does. Um, you know, so there, 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 there's, this, there's this weird tension there. Other countries automatically register everyone when they get to be registration age. Um, in most countries, because they have systems that are not like ours, quite so geographically located, you can vote anywhere in the country, which also explains why, for example, a lot of those other countries don't have the problem we have in some ways with prisoners voting, because they're voting in a national election, so it doesn't matter if you're imprisoned upstate and you came from downstate. In the United States, it actually matters, because if we allowed prisoners to vote where they live, they would vote out all of the elected officials. There are whole school districts in uh, New Orleans, right near Angola, where a majority Majority of the adults in the district are in prison. Um, so not because the majority of the people in Angola are in prison, it's because Angola's out in the middle of West Nowhere, uh, and that's where they build the prisons. Um, so, you know, that's why the Israelis and the Germans can allow prisoners to vote, because they're voting in national elections, whereas here they would be voting in, in local elections as well. So, um, I would just ask him if you have any final words for us, and then we will... Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, and thanks for the question. So.